welcome to Medicine Matters Diabetes. We're here today to talk about the new hypertension guidelines from the American Diabetes Association. My name is Jay Schubert, DO. I'm a family physici physician and diabetologist at Toro University of California. I'm pleased to have with me today Dr. Robert Chilton, DO, cardiologist, a professor of medicine and the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. He's a board certified physician in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, interventional radiology, and electrophysiology. And I see him as one of our national experts on the interface between diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much. So glad to have you here today. And what an important topic. You know, all of our patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease share the common thread of hypertension. And certainly my experience has been that hypertension is one of the hardest things to get control of. And there seems to be always new data coming along. So with the new American Diabetes Association statement, um, position statement regarding diabetes, I think it's important for us to talk with the, the public about this. So um, how do you think we can best share this information with the public is maybe the first thing I think we should talk about. Well, you know, Jay, you make some really important points. I, I think that the blood pressure guidelines, the way they were set up, are written off of uh, uh, paper publications and studies that we have done research on in the recent years. Uh, I don't always agree with the number they put in there, but for general guidelines uh, and consensus statement, I think they're reasonable. Uh, to me, the difficulty with diabetes is it's more complex than just blood pressure. Uh, if you look at our diabetes trials, probably somewhere around 80 to 95 percent, like for example in infrared, had high blood pressure. So you take the metabolic part of atherosclerosis and you couple it with wall stress, which is the blood pressure, you have a pretty atherogenic problem. If you just took a number, just the blood pressure number by itself, the blood pressure number doesn't really express the risk that I see in these patients. Um, if you have a person that has very vulnerable plaques like many of the diabetes patients do have, even small amounts of blood pressure jump sometimes can be enough to actually crack or fracture those plaques to cause cardiovascular events. So I am in the camp of wanting to be a little bit lower on the blood pressure than many of the guidelines say. Now, that's within reason. I mean, people will talk about a J-shaped curve. You get too far down and actually you increase the stroke risk or potential events. Um, I think that uh, some of those patients in there are a little bit higher risk and they have maybe disease processes that are un a little bit more than just blood pressure or diabetes related. But for the routine people that I see that have diabetes, I don't like blood pressures of 150. I don't even like blood pressure of 140. I, to me, think if it's reasonable without a lot of extra drugs, if somebody drops into the 120s, I'm very happy with that because it tells me the wall stress is off the vessel. I think most people target, you know, just the blood pressure alone thinking that's it. It's not. It's the global risk of uh, endothelial cell damage or uh, in the vascular bed that you're worried about. So to me, I think the number ought to be lower than higher. Okay. And, you know, that's a really important point because I'm sure you remember and I remember that the blood pressure goals were lower at one point. And I thought, you know, when and I always measure my practice. I'm keeping track of my, you know, blood pressure, lipid, and um, kind of all my numbers for my practice, quality improvement. Well, when the numbers went from 130 over 80 to 140 over 90, I actually thought, wait, well, hey, I don't have to do anything. My skill will be better. But actually, that's not been shown to be the case. So why is it that we have a loosened standard, yet we still don't achieve target pressures in our patients? Well, I think the standard loosened as a guideline. And I think that as a guideline, that's probably true that maybe, yes, our research does show us maybe you can get by at 140 over 90. But, you know, the SPRINT trial, uh, which many people uh, were happy to see. I mean, I, for one, was glad to see the 120 range uh, for the first time because I really believe that if, if it was my mom and dad, I would like the 120 blood pressure if I could get that uh, without – you know, five drugs. I mean, it, again, it's uh, what the way you uh, target these drugs and the way you put them together is important. Uh, I think the 140 is just too high for my diabetes population. I think those guys need to have all of their risk factors brought down lower, and certainly the higher blood pressure is a potential problem. 
So to me, I, I am not in the camp of the 140 range. I'm in the camp of the 120s, 130s. And, of course, the more damage I see from the kidney, if they have more microalbuminuria, they have more eye trouble, then I would say of the few things that I have I can bring down the wall stress with, blood pressure is one. Now, the metabolics, again, is a major player. Uh, but I think it's a combination. It's just not blood pressure as one endpoint. Sure. And that's, that's so important. And I think that, you know, when we treat hypertension, um, you know, I think the trigger for many people is that 140 over 90 to treat. But, of course, we wouldn't stop treating as soon as we got below that. So if I start someone on a, a hypertensive treatment, uh, do you have a preference on which uh, medication we use? Oh, that's a great question, Jay. This is, you know, this goes back to physiology. You know, I, I don't think many people re really look at the blood pressure formula. Basically, you have uh, a heart rate, which assuming it's in the normal range. Now, if it's a little on the high side, like 80 or 90, probably beta blockers are great choices. But in diabetes patients, they fit pretty much the standard type of page, uh, uh, patient that would require afterload and pre -row reduction. The drugs that we use for preload reduction are the most powerful because they change the stroke volume. Stroke volume, by and large, is about 80% the venous return are, uh, are coming from what coming back to the heart itself. Afterload definitely brings the pressure down because it opens the resistance vessels peripherally. So if you look at the drugs for preload and then you ask the question, well, what preload drugs do I have? I have uh, basically indepamide, uh, which has been shown in many of the trials to be positive. I have hydrochlorothiazide that is, I don't think, quite as backed up by the actual mortality and cardiovascular events that I have with chlorothaladone. The other thing about chlorothaladone, the half-life is very long. It's over sometimes in some folks 50 hours. That means that for many patients, they're not having to go uh, get up at midnight and go back to the bathroom. Hydrochlorothiazide is short half-life, and they frequently have to get up and go. The difference between them two, potassium loss is uh, more effective uh, probably with the chlorothaladone type drugs, and I think many of us are a little bit more concerned with it. But again, I have to watch my patients. But one thing chlorothaladone brings to the market is it brings the mortality benefit, uh, cardiovascular event reduction benefit. The two trials that actually are most important is the Mr. Fit trial, which again, we all paid for this. This is a government trial. It showed that actually chlorothaladone was the winner. It, it actually was one we liked. To make it even more impressive, all had did not use hydrochlorothiazide because we knew chlorothaladone decreased events and found that actually, compared to the other drugs, it actually did quite well. So chlorothaladone would be one I would consider starting with. In the African-American population, and certainly Caribbean population, even in the European guidelines, they recommend chlorothaladone, not hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, chlorothaladone has now been moved into a position to where it is probably the preferred agent. And, and if you look carefully at the guidelines, the way it's stated is thiazide light diuretic. That's not hydrochlorothiazide. That's chlorothaladone. Um, and I'm not sure why they don't just come out and say that, other than keep in mind, indepamide was shown to be very beneficial. And I think indepamide and chlorothaladone are both good choices. Now, flip to the other side of the equation, working on afterload. There must be 80 drugs to work on afterload. So for me in diabetes, I pick drugs that have a positive benefit on glucose or ones that potentially might have an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Many of the ARBs have that capability to leave names out. There are some of the ARBs that actually show an improvement in insulin sensitivity in diabetes. The beta blockers, on the other hand, are really nice if you have a person that's a little hyperadrenergic. You take a younger guy that has got a mild increase in heart rate. It works on afterload, and the afterload over time is brought down because of the effects in the brain actually on dropping the afterload. So the beta blockers have not only a blood pressure fall, they also have some benefits if you take a look at the actual cardiovascular event reduction. Calcium channel blockers, great choices well tolerated and they have a number of uh, very nice studies uh, that have been shown and many of the drugs uh, have been very beneficial and very nice in study. I think that's kind of the general ones that most of us really look at and target. There are many other choices, but in general, that's kind of how it fits together, Jay. 
Wow, and you know, I think you've really brought some important points here that even though we have a guideline that uses 140 over 90, there are certainly people we probably should get uh, to lower numbers, particularly when we're thinking about that blood vessel and the stress in the blood vessel. You know, I think we all can understand plumbing and too much going through a blood vessel. That's, that's something that's universal. And think about that balanced preload and afterload attack when we're going to do blood pressure control. Yeah, one of the things, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, but I think it's worthwhile. Many of you measure blood pressure. If you want the very best one for end organ damage for research, it's 24-hour ambulatory. That's what many people are talking about. The other thing that many people don't realize, there's a central aortic pressure that actually Michael Leroy, in many of the trials that were done, uh, and uh, again, calcium channel blocker trials that showed that even if the blood pressure in the arm is exactly the same, the central aortic pressure in some of the antihypertensive drugs actually can lower the workload of the heart that you cannot see from an arm blood pressure. So I would probably look into more of the calcium channel blockers in that specific type of patient if you have a person still having events. There's mask hypertension that's been recently talked about a lot. People who actually at work with pray, they go home, hey, blood pressure's higher. Uh, people who don't dip at night. Uh, some of the new SGLT2 drugs uh, actually have shown improvement. I've published on it. Many other folks have looked at it too. They actually have an ability to actually improve the non-dipping and bring it back towards a dipper, which decreases their cardiovascular risk potentially. You don't really know that yet. But we have some neat drugs now that actually, for the first time in diabetes, these cardiovascular diabetes drugs actually decrease your blood pressure four to five millimeters. And if you look at it, many antihypertensive drugs, that's all they lowered anyway. Mm. So not only do we have good blood pressure medicines, now we have diabetes medications that also lower blood pressure that we really could be getting some synergy from. That's, yes. That's great. Well, I really appreciate your insights today and what an important topic and I look forward to speaking to you sometime in the near future about other things is related to the ADA Joint Position Statement Hypertension. Thank you, Jay.